Well, welcome everyone to Anvil and Hammer episode, episode seven, number seven. I usually introduce the episode. I know, but I felt maybe you need a bit of my input, but it's okay. So this is like providential number because we are looking at the book of Genesis. What's that got to do with the, the number book seven? Of Genesis because there's seven days in creation. Oh yeah, okay. Book there of we Genesis go. Two. Trailer voice. Yeah, mm. and we're looking at Genesis chapters one and two, which are the controversial tap the controversial can't say that word the controversial, controversial chapters yeah arguably the most controversial chapters in the entire bible mm-hmm. the book of genesis is really important that we examine this because literally every doctrine has its roots in the book of genesis and it's the one that people will usually the world will usually attack because if you destroy genesis you've really destroyed the gospel because the gospel is rooted in Genesis. So this is a topic we explore. We interviewed a friend of ours called Simon Turpin. Simon Turpin from Answers in Genesis UK, which is really cool because Sean and I, we love Answers in Genesis. We love that ministry. It's fantastic. So it was really, really cool to have Simon Turpin on. I suppose the hint is kind of in the title, isn't it? Because Genesis means beginnings, right? Yeah. Beginning. So um, if it was anywhere else in the Bible. That would That'd be, be kind, kind of, of confusing. confusing. Some Christians might kind of skim over the importance of this issue because they think, oh, you know, secondary to the gospel and just not something that's really focused on. But the thing we're going to question is, is it? Is it secondary to the gospel? It's the foundation for all doctrine in the Bible, the foundation for the gospel. And that's why it is so important to know. Since one of the purposes of the Army Bible board game is to teach apologetics and to teach the Bible in the home, we think it's really important that this subject is covered. So we've been doing lots of work on the website for the Armory at the moment. We've updated the components, so all the pictures are there, so you can know exactly what is in the box. We have updated the how to play video, which previously was the how to play for the pre-manufactured version of the Armory. So now we have it all up to date. Hopefully that's going to be a resource that you're going to be able to learn how to play the game really quickly and easily so i hope that's going to help you and i hope the subject is something that you can incorporate once again into the game so i think without further ado let's get started well simon once again thank you for joining us on this podcast the anvil and hammer so i suppose we just start things off by maybe explaining who are you <laughs> well i work for uh, an apologetics ministry called answers and genesis and basically i'm the executive director of the uk branch many people would have heard of ken ham who's the ceo of answers and genesis in the us who also built helped built the ark encounter here in the uk we have an answers and genesis ministry i'm the primary speak and we also have people like professor stuart burgess professor andy mcintosh and professor steve taylor speak for us so we're an apologetics ministry basically defending the authority of scripture yeah i think that's what we really like about answers in genesis is that i think a lot of people think of you as a creation ministry but actually answers in genesis is an authority ministry it's trying to get people back to the scriptures and what does the bible actually teach about origins so that's really helpful yeah, I mean, one of the primary things that we deal with is obviously the issue of creation evolution, but that's based upon the authority of Scripture, our belief in the historicity of the book of Genesis. We hold to what we believe in because of Scripture, not because of science. Great. Amen. So in the U.S., we have the Ark Encounter, we have the mm-hmm. Creation Museum. Is there anything coming to Europe? Because it's a bit of a, a trek to get there from here. <laughs> Uh, unless you have 50 million pounds to, to build an ark or something you want to give us. Um, maybe one day we'd like to maybe do something along the lines of, of a, a museum, but that would be in the future. We would need to raise significant funds, but maybe possibly one day if we can get enough support behind us, we would like to have a place where people could come in and see the truth of God's word from the beginning, which is what they're trying to do in the U.S. with the museum. You know, there are many secular museums, Smithsonian uh, in the U.S., the Natural History Museum over here where people go into and they can see visible things, which, you know, they used to support the theory of evolution. But it would be great to have something maybe one day over here that shows the truth of creation. Do you think that there would be enough support at the moment here from Christians? Because... 
in our limited experience, the topic of creation seems to be a bit taboo. Yeah, at the moment, prob probably not because you would need many more supporters, but sometimes God can raise up faithful people. It, yes, you know, yeah. you know, when it comes to the issue of creation and the days of creation, the age of the earth, you will find that there are a few people in the church who will hold to what the Bible says just because of the influence of the culture when it comes to the teaching of evolution mm. and many leaders in the church won't take a stand and it won't ever speak on the issue within their churches. So people in the congregations just don't see it as an issue or aren't even aware of what the issues are. So you will find that many people in this, in this country don't hold to, to what the Bible teaches. They'll happily go with God used the big bang or the, the evolution of man. There never was a local, you know, there never was a flood um, because of the influence of, of evolution in millions of years. You have a completely different culture because in Ireland, you don't have the Christian heritage there like you do here. So mm -hmm. a lot of believers would have come out of the Catholic Church. So there is a culture generally among evangelical Christians in Ireland of really, really testing things because they would come from a Catholic background. So they'd yeah. be forced to go to the scripture and and... And, really and have to deal with it exactly yeah so that's that's yeah. why i mean we noticed that when we because we go to northern ireland we go to the republic island quite a bit and we notice in the churches there at least the evangelical conservative churches that many of those churches still would hold to the authority of scripture when it comes to genesis and um, the days of creation the flood the historicity of adam so we're thankful for that and that's because like you say they have to go to scripture they'll go to scripture scripture is their final authority because in in places like england and even scotland wales where you know the culture is dominated for so long and you know we've lost really the reformation in this country people don't see scripture as authoritative therefore then that's not the first place to go to so Simon, how many children do you have? <laughs> I, I have seven children. Praise Ooh, God. Wow. <laughs> That's yeah. great. The, the oldest is seven. Wow. Wow. Really? What a year. <laughs> oh, wow. So we have, we have two sets of twins. Oh, wow. Yeah. Praise so God. People understand. <laughs> That's just brilliant. That's it's, amazing. It's great to see. Wow. And, and we home educate our children. Wonderful. We, we plan to as well. Yeah, no, it's great to see because I, I hope that secularism will die in this country simply through through marriages and creating children because they're not having children or they're having very few. And it's really just it's really just Christians and Muslims having children. So I reckon 20 years, there's not going to be, there's going to be a change in the culture if Christians have lots of kids. And that's, that's really the hope that we, we raise up godly offspring. Yeah. yeah, secularism has really deteriorated the family, broken the family up which obviously goes against what God originally designed in creation, you know, for, for there to be one man and one woman in a, in a marriage for life. And so you, you do see the effects of secularism on the family today, sadly, and the breakups of families. And, and even within the church, people are getting married later on in life and, and, mm -hmm. and leaving children to, to the even many years till after they're married and they don't see the family unit as being uh, a big thing in their eyes, you know. So, you know, God blesses families with children. Obviously, there are, there are people who can't have children for various reasons. But mm. like you say, it's one way of, of redeeming the culture, I guess, is is through Christians taking on that role. Fathers teaching and being a priest to their family. It's, um, mm. you know, such an important thing. We start every day in our household by um, before I leave the house we'll sit down with the children and we'll we'll catechize our children and teach them the faith because we want them to know what the, the faith is all about oh, that's great I work a lot with children and youth and I, I've just come to a greater understanding of how important fathers are in this mm -hmm. ministry and a child spending an hour a week with me in a group where we're probably doing 15, 20 minutes of actual Bible reading, the rest is set up in games. That cannot be the main source of spiritual investment in that child. So it has to come from the home. And we have so yeah. many so many scriptures about fathers leading their homes, teaching their children, as, as you have said. There's one reason why we developed this board game the Armory Bible board game, it was as an incentive to encourage fathers to teach the Bible in the home in a fun and interactive way. So that's been a project that we've both been involved in. It's one reason that we started this podcast as well. It's to yeah. educate people on these subjects and to sort of hit important issues like we're hitting today 
that need to be taught in the home. Yeah, absolutely. The home is is a primary unit that God uses to minister to people. You know, you can't expect the church to do that because the church has maybe one, two hours on a Sunday. And even if you leave it to your youth group, Sunday school, that's not going to cut it. It's the family God has used and ordained for that means. It's not to say he won't use the church, obviously, because he does. That's how God uses uses that. But he's given us the family and fathers need to take an, an active role in raising their children. And even for fathers today, they need to realize, you know, half an hour in the morning, it'll be so helpful to spend with your families, to start the day off, to teach them the word of God, to sit and pray with their family. And, and as Deuteronomy 6 says, it's a, it's not just a set time of the day, but it's the whole day. It's the whole mm-hmm. of the week where you're training your children, you're sitting down with the children, you're using all of life to explain who, who God is to them. So it's, it covers every aspect of life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. So what I'm going to do now, Simon, is I'm going to give you some propositions, some statements, and okay. then I just want you to respond to them, see what, see what you think, okay? Mm-hmm. So when it comes to Genesis, I think a lot of people are fine with, with Genesis, mm-hmm. but it's really the controversy happens in chapters 1 and 2, and there's some controversy a- after that as well, but I think prim- primarily people have controversy over chapters 1 and 2. So what, how would you respond to someone who says, well, Genesis 1 and 2 is poetry, shouldn't be taken... As a plain reading, this is obviously poetry. Well, primarily, I would say um, just look at the language. Look at the Psalms. If you want to read poetry, go to the Psalms and see if Genesis reads like the Psalms because it reads nothing like the Psalms. You know, if you read the Psalms, it's full of parallelism, which is a marker of Hebrew poetry, restating one thing after another. But if you look at Genesis, it, it's, it's clearly written as historical narrative. God did this, and then he did this, and then he did this. All the way through, it uses the Hebrew, what they call Vav consecutive, which is, if you look at other books that are historical in the Old Testament, it, it's full of those markers. So it's it's not poetry. And if even if you look in, in the New Testament, how do the New Testament authors take the book of Genesis? They don't treat it as poetry, just to make a theological point. They treat it as history. If you read in Matthew 19, when Jesus confronts the Pharisees on the issue of marriage, he treats Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, because he treats uh, he quotes from both of those chapters, as, as history. And Paul, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, clearly understands Genesis as history. And in Romans 5, of course, 1 Corinthians 15, clearly understands Genesis as history. Okay, so they say we establish it as history, but these days, maybe they just are symbols for undefined periods of time. So they're really, they're, he's, this is more telling us the sequence of how God did it and not the exact amount of time. Yeah, again, again, if you just read the chapters, it doesn't it doesn't read that way. But if you want a commentary on the days of creation, well, the Bible gives you a commentary in Exodus chapter 20 when God gives the law to Moses. He tells you, for in six days, God created the heavens and the earth and, and all that is in them. He tells us four in six days. And if you read the days in Genesis 1, they're defined by evening and morning. So if you want to know what makes up a 24-hour day, even in the morning. In fact, scholars really no longer would argue, I would say, about whether the days are 24 hours. Because the, the fact is, even those scholars who wouldn't believe in the history of Genesis and the young earth would say, look, if, if you want to know what the author said, he clearly believed the days were 24 hours. You know, John Walton, who believes Genesis is, is a myth, would, would say that, for example, in some of the literature he's written. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we live in such a, a postmodern society where we think that all views of scripture can be held and that it's okay as long as we, we get along. Mm-hmm. And so people just say, well, that's just your interpretation. But the issue isn't whether we have differing interpretations, it's whether our interpretations are sound. Do they, yeah. are, do they, do the Bible's only saying one thing, right? So one of us has to be wrong. And like you said, Exodus 20, verses 9 and 11. No, that's the nail in the coffin. That's the bait mm-hmm. over. You can prove from Scripture alone that this is six literal 24-hour days. So there shouldn't really be a problem with being bold. If you take the Bible seriously, if you take the a Bible at a plain reading, you can prove from the Scripture itself that this is definitely 
24 hour days. Yeah, I mean, if you read it, it's clear you, you don't get the idea of millions of years or evolution from reading Genesis. That comes from imposing ideas from outside the Bible on Genesis. And even in the New Testament, Jesus says, for example, in Mark 10, says, for at the beginning of creation, you know, God made man, you know, and mm. when when's the beginning of creation? Well, in an evolutionary timeline, it's it's 14 billion years ago, and then you have to wait for millions and millions of years till man appears on the scene. Evolutionists would today would say man came out of Africa 200,000 years ago. Well, that's not the beginning of creation. The beginning of creation, when you read the Bible, is well, at least when God created man, is on day six. Jesus clearly held to a young earth. And again, just read history, Christian history, on what did people like Luther believe, what did people like Calvin believe the, the Westminster divines, the Puritans, all held to a six-day creation, young earth. There was a historical Adam who sinned, because that's such an important issue today. Yes, the days are important, but how many scholars today are rejecting that there ever was a historical Adam, or, you know, Adam was something other than the first man? You know, some people say, well, it's not really important that Genesis 1 or 2 is narrative history or poetry, you know, what's important is the gospel. You know, Genesis and the whole Old Testament is pointing to Jesus anyway, so we should just focus on Jesus. How would you respond to someone who brings that up? Well, then you have to ask, what's the gospel? If you want a definition of the gospel, you go to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, where he tells the people there, for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was being seen by Cephas and the twelve. And he goes on, the gospel there is on Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And of course, if you go on in Paul's chapter there, in 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about in verse 21, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Mm. So Adam is a part of the gospel. The reason Jesus died a physical death on the physical cross was because Paul tells us that sin and death came into the world through Adam. And later on in the chapter, he describes Jesus as the last Adam who came to take the place of the first Adam, who was victorious on the cross. You know, so the gospel message is founded in mm. those early chapters of Genesis. If you do away with a historical Adam, then why do you need Jesus to die on the cross? It's right there in Genesis chapter 3, isn't it? It's 3.16? 3.15. pretty evangelium. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. First mention of the gospel is right there in the third chapter where that the the seed of the woman would would bruise the serpent yes, yes. absolutely his head press. and he will yeah. uh, bruise his heel so you know what what do you do with that if you don't believe adam and eve were real figures in history yes yeah, many scholars today would just dismiss that and you know even in conservative circles they probably wouldn't see that as a promise of, of, of the gospel because things like higher criticism and redaction criticism all these different sort of critical methods they bring to the old testament mm. um, but again historic christianity has held that as a promise of of a coming redeemer and if you follow the old testament through from noah to the promise and calling of abraham and, and the seed you find the fulfillment of that promise in in the new testament and the coming of our lord and savior jesus christ and again paul plays that out in romans 5 and as we read 1 corinthians 15 where there's the first adam and the last adam if there wasn't a literal first adam then why do you need a last adam yeah. you know a historic person doesn't take away the sin of a mythical person yeah yeah, so it really undermines the gospel, doesn't it? So it would be like someone saying, I believe in the gospel, I just don't believe in miracles. Well, yeah, you yeah. know, in order <laughs> to believe the gospel, it, it's predicated upon a miracle that Jesus rose from the dead. You know? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Today, even if you ask people, you know, what is the gospel? How many different sayings are you going to get? Yeah. You know, how many, you know, you'll get this definition of the gospel, you get that definition of the gospel. How many people will be able to say, for example, what I just read from 1 Corinthians 15, because Paul says this is the gospel. Mm. The gospel is focused upon Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. The gospel isn't about a better life. The gospel you know, isn't about God making me more prosperous or having healthy living. It's about Jesus. So if you're, if you're not talking about Jesus and his death and resurrection, then you're not talking about the gospel. Yeah, absolutely.
So what is the most common objection that you come across in the UK when referring to Genesis as history? I think the primary objection comes down to the fact that people have really succumbed to the lie of evolution and millions of years because they believe, you know, scientists have proven the earth to be very old. They've proven that we come from a common ancestor. Therefore, you can't treat Genesis as historical. It, it has to be something other than, than history. There's events that actually took place in time and space. That's the primary objection we would get. You, you get people who try and say, oh, well, a day can be anything other than a 24-hour day, or oh, that the flood was only a local event. You know, oh, you can have Adam as a head of a tribe or a Neolithic farmer, as some people are saying, and they try and reinterpret it. But the main objection is because of the influence of evolution mm. and millions of years. So it's to do with people's presuppositions, to do with their yeah. starting points. They're bringing pre-beliefs to the text and trying to enforce it into the text. It's to, it's to do, yeah, with their presuppositions, but also their authority because like we were talking about the Reformation at the beginning, people no longer see or really believe in sola scriptura. It's um, scripture sub scientia, you know, scriptures under science. Hmm. People go to science first, then scripture, because they really don't believe that God Almighty has spoken clearly in his word. We've lost the idea of the perspicuity of scripture, the clarity of scripture that comes out of sola scriptura. We had the anniversary of the Reformation last year, 500 years since Luther nailed, you know, those theses to the door of Wittenberg Castle. And, you know, we need to reclaim that today because we've, we've totally lost it in this culture, at least in this country, I think. It's not only an issue of authority. I, I've come to understand because a mm -hmm. lot of people would have a high view of scripture, but they're sort of reinterpreting it or they're saying these yeah. things are difficult to understand. Therefore, we need to go to outside things. So really, it's an issue of authority, but it's also an issue of the doctrine of perspicuity. Mm -hmm. Is the Bible understandable? Can we yeah. know the scripture? Do we have to go to things outside of the scripture or is the scripture sufficient in itself? Is it in a sense systematic? Because I think some people, they say, yes, no, this is authoritative. However, it's difficult to understand. So therefore, this has to be an analogy and so on and so forth. Do we believe the scripture is, can, can it be understood by children? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you've got scholars today like John Walton, who's becoming famous, even in conservative circles, who's an academic in the U.S., who believes Genesis founded in its, its worldview of its time, an, an ancient Near East, Eastern worldview. So he would say, you can't read Genesis by itself. You need to look at these other ancient Near Eastern views of creation and, and then interpret Genesis through the lens of the ancient Near Eastern worldview. So it's not Genesis that's authoritative. It's these other worldviews that help us read Genesis. It's views like that within the church today. But again, he has an authority above the word of God. And he does, in that view, scripture isn't clear because he would say, and he said this in some of his books, you know, the average person can't just read Genesis. They need trained Old Testament scholars who've studied the, the customs, the cultures of the day and who know Hebrew to be able to explain what Genesis really means to them. Yeah, which contradicts scripture because we're all familiar with 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scriptures given by inspiration of God yep. is profitable for doctrine, so on and so forth. But if you read the verse above it, Paul is commending Timothy that from childhood, he has mm -hmm. known the Holy scriptures, Holy scriptures, which is able to make him wise to salvation. So this tells us a great deal about the scriptures. One, it tells us the scriptures can actually be known and that from they can be known from childhood. <laughs> yeah. And they, that they're able they, to make someone to make wise. wise for salvation. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So John... Timothy wouldn't have understood what John Walton was saying because <laughs> he, he he had the scriptures. He knew that he could trust the scriptures that were there to, to teach him. And, you know, you think about Jesus in the Gospels. How many times does he say, have you not read? It is written. And he was speaking to people of the day who knew the scriptures. Hmm. And he didn't say, well, let me sit down and explain this Hebrew phrase to you because I don't think you really get it sort of thing. He said, no, have you not read? It is written. You think about a number of the letters in the New Testament, for example, Galatians, Philippians, 1 Corinthians, they weren't just written to the elders of the church or, or the pastor of the church. They were written to the entire congregation mm. for the congregations to read and understand, mm. you know, so they were made up of all sorts of people from different backgrounds, the educated, the uneducated. And Paul's assumption was that they could understand what he was saying. 
Yeah. Mm. Again, Jesus in John chapter 8 says, If you abide in my word, you are my mm-hmm. disciples indeed. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So the scriptures can be known. So these yep. ideas about, oh, we all have our different interpretations. Well, we're actually to strive to know the true interpretation. We're to strive to know the truth. That's part of being Christians, being a Berean, searching the scriptures daily, seeing whether these things were so, but also receiving new ideas with openness, as long as you bring them back to the scriptures. We've lost that in the church today. People obviously no longer believe in really in the authority, or even though if they say they do, they don't really believe in the authority of scripture or the perspicuity scripture. They have to find these theologians to back up their views because really their views don't come from the scriptures. They come in from outside sources. We've got articles on our website which will, will help people with that if they want to find out more about what these scholars really believe and what the agenda they're really trying to push. Now, what is the secular understanding of the age of the earth? Do you have any idea? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's always changing, but currently it's around the, the world. Uh, the universe is about 14.5 or 14 billion years old. Okay, so th- I think this will help people understand what's being said, right? Let's say every second represents a year, mm-hmm. okay? To get to 6,000 years, right, it takes an hour and 40 minutes, yeah. Okay, which is quite a long time. If you're sitting in a room by yourself looking at a clock at, at a tick, you know, an hour and 40 minutes later, ah, there, that's 6,000 years. Okay. Now, to, to get 1 billion years, if every second represents a year, to get 1 billion years, it would take 31.6 years. years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's just 1 billion. So they're saying 14 billion it's absurd. You've left the realms of human comprehension. You may as well be saying once upon a time or in a galaxy far, far away. So people need to understand this, that when you're repeating to numbers so big, you're going outside the scopes of human comprehension. And currently in my life, there's not enough seconds <laughs> to, to do that. Yeah. To do that. And if someone started, had a stopwatch and clicked it as soon as I was born, we would still be counting, trying to get to one billion. One billion. Is that billion yeah. or million? That That's like a million. million. Yeah, if you give people an incomprehensible number, an amount of time, they're they're just going to, yeah, you know, they're not going to think about it. And it goes over their head and, you know, and the scientists have their reasons for for trying to, for saying the universe is billions of years old, of Mm. course, because, you know, they don't believe in a supernatural creator. The primary paradigm that rules thinking in, in science today is naturalism, not supernaturalism, which would go against many of the founding fathers of modern science who were Bible believing mm. Christians. So, so that's why they come up with these great ages of the earth because they're naturalists mm. and yeah. they assume a naturalistic worldview. You think about what said in isaiah forty-five eighteen that god created the world to be inhabited that's meaningless if you believe in an old earth because then god didn't create the world to be inhabited because think about all that time there is like you've just talked about until man gets on the universe mm-hmm. you know that's an incomprehensible incom- amount of time if you know god then didn't create the world to be inhabited and so that scripture is meaningless mm-hmm. when it comes to the the idea of an old earth you know, many Christians are inconsistent because they might believe in the Big Bang and that understanding of the beginning of the universe, but evolution isn't just about the beginning of the world, it's about the end of the world. Mm. Because for the evolutionist, there's no new heavens and there's no new earth, there's just what they call a heat death when all the available energy in the universe runs down, the universe will suddenly die because all the energy's gone, it'll just become cold place. Yeah, and if, so you, if, you, if you trace that philosophy, that it's actually rooted in Hinduism, this, the cycles of birth and death yeah. and the universe starting from one single point and expanding, that, that comes from Hinduism. The philosophy is rooted in paganism. So what you yeah. really have is neo-paganism. But, you know, you think about that from a Christian perspective, a sign of inconsistency, and I've, I know there's one scholar out there who says inconsistency is a sign of a failed argument. And I think that's really good because you, you imagine you believe in an old earth, but yet you believe in a new heavens and a new earth. Well, sorry, that's that's inconsistent because you get the idea of a new heavens and a new earth from scripture, but you don't get the idea of an old earth from scripture. You get that from naturalistic science. But if you were to be consistent, wouldn't you have to stand with those same scientists still and say, well, yeah, there's going to be a heat death when all that energy goes away. Why don't you follow them then? If you follow them for the beginning, why don't you follow them to the end? Thankfully, they're inconsistent. 
you know it's blessed inconsistency but you know think about it why don't they follow them through because they realize the bible doesn't say that but the bible doesn't say that about the beginning as well it says that god created and he he created in a certain amount of time yeah Mm -hmm. so you brought up a good point saying that the there's a pervading philosophy called naturalism which is influencing people's ideas mm-hmm. but i would i would also say it's also the view of empiricism that all knowledge is gained through experience or all knowledge yeah. is gained through uh, testing and the, the 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 first thing is is that philosophy itself wasn't gained through experimental testing they yeah. just assume it <laughs> but the other thing is there's certain things that you cannot appeal to your experience to understand and I think this is the pervading view for most people in this country. So what I do is I ask people, uh, what do you think happens at death? Yeah. Because you haven't experienced death. So there's no yeah. way for you to know through experience what death is like. Yeah. So then at that point, they, they usually give me some opinion. And I say, yeah, but how do you know? How do you know that's the case? And they say, well, I don't. Eventually, they get to admit it. And then I'd say, well, do you think God knows? Yeah. And then you, you can get to the gospel. And I think that's a great way of exposing the, the failures of empiricism and also people's ideas of death, that usually they're just trying to make something up, but God knows. And in fact, he died and rose. <laughs> yeah, if you, yeah, exactly. And if you don't start with God as, as the creator and ruler of all things, then whatever philosophy you hold to will be self-contradictory and self-refuting. I agree. And you, you don't have to spend too long with people in conversation to, to realize that. You know, people will say, oh, well, there's no such thing as truth. Is that true? <laughs> you find all these silly ideas on the university campuses that are held by people because they really haven't been taught to think logically. Mm-hmm. They just assume everything they hear from their philosophy professor or, the, or is a professor in science or what, whatever, and they just assume it. They don't really think or, or grasp the concept that they're being taught in, in their classes. Yeah. And one powerful statement, which is so simple, is that you know God created some things to look like perhaps they were more mature yeah like adam he created adam as a an adult man he wasn't a baby he created a a mature world yeah absolutely god created a fully functional world for people to live in god Mm. didn't create a world in which adam would have to wait several months for the bananas to come off the trees because that (laughs) would be ridiculous yeah exactly. he created a world ready for him to live in and if you looked at adam when he was created would he have looked old most probably you know we can assume that from scripture i think mm. he wouldn't have looked like baby mm. or because how then would he re- reproduce with eve so yeah we we would assume that the world god created was fully functional it was mature and when people talk about well the world looks old well who does it look old to they believe in a, an appearance of age that it must be old because of their belief in an old universe but it doesn't look when i look at the world it doesn't look old it might look sin cursed because what i know from scripture and you can see the effects of the flood when you look at canyons around you where god devastated the world judged the world through through a flood yeah and i, I suppose it comes down to understanding of what you mean by old because i don't think 6000 euros is short <laughs> i think that's, no no it's that's a very years, long time so right yeah yeah we in our lifetime will experience maybe 70 80 at, at the most right yeah that's a lot but thousands can't really comprehend that as well i resist the term young earth creationist i uh i don't like that term <laughs> we would try and say biblical creation because what mm. we would say and people don't like us saying that of course because they <laughs> try really saying well, your view isn't biblical which it which we would believe isn't. Yeah. You know, we talk about biblical creation because it's the view of creation, the view of the fall, the view of the flood, the view of the Tower of Babel that comes out of reading scripture. Mm. Yeah. I think as well, a lot of people see evolution as a view about the past. But as you've rightly said, it's also a view about the future. But it's also a view about the future when it comes to humanity. If yeah. evolution is still happening, well, therefore, what are we evolving into? And basically... And I know a lot of people believe this is that one day we will be godlike, right? We're going to mm-hmm. reach this the status of evolutionary development where we will be like God, and it's you know that sounds very s- familiar. Yeah, you can yeah. go back to Genesis three and what was the the old trick there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Evolution is a philosophy about the whole of life, not just about the past. It's about the whole of life. You think about what's going on today with issues of gender. You wouldn't get the issue of transgenderism out of biblical creation because God made them male and female. And that's all we know, that there are males and and there are females. In order to get to transgenderism, then you have to have a completely different 
worldview. If we're just animals and anything goes, whatever you can get away with basically becomes the morality. Yeah, that's an important apologetic point. When you're trying to witness to people, people often talk about all the death and suffering in the world. Well, if you don't believe in God, then you have no reason to believe in things good or bad because they're just indifferent, blind, pitiless, indifferent, as the poet said. But if you believe in God, then there's a reason why there's good and, uh, and bad in the world. As well, I would mention to people is that, yes, God allows suffering temporarily, mm -hmm. but one day he's going to remove all suffering for his people. Oh, absolutely, yeah. For his people, he'll remove all suffering. But if you believe in evolution, you believe that this is going to not only has been for billions of years, but it's going to continue in the future. You'll notice in many evolutionary philosophies, they try and look for a utopia. When they mm. try, you think about eugenics, what was that mm. about? It was It was trying to get rid of all the people who, according to Hitler at the time of the Second World War, were, were below him, were substandard, mm. were subhuman. And so you try and get rid of them from society and create a society which will be, uh, lead to a utopia. So there is that because people recognize, yeah, there's, there's, we live in a messed up world and they, they're trying to have their own utopia, their own new heavens and new earth, but you're not going to do it that way. Yeah, trying to get a utopia without God is like trying to quench your thirst without water. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The late Stephen Hawking would often talk about the fact that humans need to leave this earth because we just annihilate each other and therefore we need to find a planet which is habitable for us. By the way, there is no planet. The only planet that's habitable is planet Earth, the, the planet God created um, to be inhabitable. But that's that's part of the evolutionary philosophy. And he would talk about, you know, maybe aliens are out there who have a higher technology than us who can give us eternal life can live forever if we ultimately find that but you don't need to, to go into outer space to look for eternal life because the god man died on the cross for a reason that we could have eternal life people believe if, if life evolved on this earth then it probably evolved somewhere else as well which is why they believe in aliens mm -hmm. ultimately trace it back it's part of the the philosophy of evolution it's not nothing to do with science you know people say to us oh why do you waste all that money on the ark and and so on and so forth mm -hmm. or think about how much scientists waste in looking for extraterrestrial life. People look for life in outer space where there's no evidence, and yet they can't even recognize life in a mother's womb yes. here on Earth. I was just thinking about that. There's a yeah. great meme going around where, you know, if, if they find something on Mars, they'll call it life, but they try and their best to completely avoid admitting to the baby in the womb being Alive. Absolutely. And it's, that's because of spiritual consequences, because we're told in, in the scripture that a child has life in his mother's womb. And people will say that with, with Mars. Pe scientists believe, you know, there was once a global flood on Mars. And how much liquid water do you find on Mars today? Zero. You know, this planet is covered in 70%. Its, its surface is 70% water. And yet scientists say there never was a global flood. Mm. So, yes, yeah. Because if there was a flood, what does that mean? There was a God who judged sin. Mm -hmm. And that's mm. really the reason they don't want to believe mm. in, in a flood. It's not because of the evidence. It's because, as Peter says in, in, in 2 Peter, it's because of their lust. Yeah, the fact that you look at Mars and you don't see life there, surely that is proof that molecule-to-man evolution is not true. Because how come life hasn't evolved in such a way to live on that planet? Yeah, mm. I mean, we, we talked about the fact that Isaiah says in 45, 18, that God created this world to be inhabited. You know, when you look at the other worlds, the other planets in the cosmos, they're beautiful, they show God's glory. Mm -hmm. But one thing they sh also show is they're not designed for life. You can't have life on those other planets. Mm -hmm. Only this planet is designed for life. You know, Mars, the atmosphere is all wrong for life. It's too thin, it's got toxic atmosphere. But this planet is perfectly designed for life. Mm. So coming back to the idea of evolution being an idea about the future, there's a movement called transhumanism. I don't know if you're familiar. Oh, yeah. So the idea is that you're merging yourself with technology so that eventually you will become immortal and be, you'll be able to move your consciousness from different, basically, ma machines, and therefore you, you'll reach immortality. Well, I can tell you for a fact that will never work because in mm -hmm. 1 Timothy 6.16, Paul set, writes to Timothy saying, about Jesus, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light. So Jesus Christ is the only way to immortality. You want to be immortal? Come to Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. 
it's just another way to avoid God, really, isn't it? To try mm -hmm. and create a, a human way to eternal life. God has made that way through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know as sinful human beings that they'll do anything to avoid that, which is why we go out and preach, preach the gospel. You know, transhumanism, again, it's not science. It's scientism. It's science mm -hmm. fiction. <laughs> you know, fiction, yeah. it's, it's sort of Star Trek. You know, it's not it's not reality. It's people wanting to escape the knowledge of God. Mm. We like to know how do you suggest we go about lovingly challenging Christians on this issue here in this, I suppose, kind of Christian culture? Because we come from a very different Christian culture back in Ireland. So what advice would you have for us in engaging with Christians on this issue here? As we've, we've already talked about the authority of Scripture, and if you're a Christian, that should be your foundation. What do the scriptures say about these issues and so that's where i would begin with christians is scripture mm. i would start to, to talk to them about what genesis says how the new testament interprets genesis how paul uses adam and romans 5 and 1 corinthians 15 how peter talks about the flood and 2 peter 3 how jesus addresses the issue of creation in the gospels so i talk to them about what the bible says about these issues and then you can bring in some issues from science if you want into that to help. But if you're a Christian, then you're obliged to go to Scripture. You should be Bereans. You should believe what Scripture says. You know, when you think about what Jesus, well, who Jesus is and what he's done, well, you ask the question, what did Jesus believe about these issues? And it's clear that Jesus held to the biblical account of creation. Well, if he's your Lord and Savior, how could you have a different view than he had? It just doesn't make sense. Mm. So that's how I would challenge Christians. I, I would go to the scriptures with them. If you're speaking with non-Christians, then I think it's it's good to see how Paul deals with non-Christians in places like Acts 17. He uses the revelation of God in creation, doesn't he, and challenges them that way. As well with Exodus 20, verses 9 to 11, in six days God creates, you actually know Genesis' history from Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. And it says, and it concludes the, the creation, uh, the six-day creation. It says this, this is the history mm -hmm. of the heavens and the earth, or this is the generations of the heavens and the earth and how they and when they were created. So right there in the text, it says, this is history. Yeah, absolutely. You have that. And that, that phrase in, in Hebrew is, is the phrase toledot. Mm. And you have that running throughout Genesis, Genesis 2, Genesis 6, you know, Genesis 11, and then as you run through the, uh, the patriarchs, right into the end of Genesis, that's a structure that runs through the whole of the book of Genesis. Mm. And so if you're going to say, well, Genesis 2 or Genesis 1 into chapter 11 isn't history, well, then is Genesis 12 to 50 history? Mm. Because it has those same historical markers. Right, Simon, do you have any final thoughts before we wrap things up? Well, yeah, if people have questions or resources they want to get hold of they can go to our website answersandgenesis.org if they live in the uk go to answersandgenesis.co.uk and that'll take you to our web store in the uk if you want to order things from the uk but if you want articles and and information it's answersandgenesis.org and you, you'll find thousands of, of lay level arguments if you want more academic stuff there's that as well on scientific issues on biblical issues if you want to look into some of these things this, this is important for people in the church to get to grips with and if you live in the republic of ireland if we'll have a conference there later on in the year in november 2nd mm -hmm. and 3rd of november in athlone at athlone springs hotel so if you ever get a chance to come to a meeting on creation then Try and find one in your area and head along to learn more about, about creation. Well, there you have it, folks. Simon Turpin, Answers in Genesis. Make sure to check out answersingenesis.org. And check out answersingenesis.co.uk for the UK and for the Republic of Ireland if you want to buy anything. So check out their UK website to buy things. Right, Sarah, I think it's hammer time. The concept is that we read a scripture and we hammer out the truth right, of it. Yeah. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Psalm 23, verse yes. 3. I love that psalm. I, I, it's the one psalm I know by heart. It's, it's great that God is the one leading us in righteousness for his name's sake. Mm -hmm. And you see that throughout the Old Testament. I'm doing this for my name's sake, not because of you. And mm -hmm. it's very encouraging. Mm -hmm. and comforting that as Romans 8 says if God is for us who can be against us yeah which you, by the way you can actually reverse logically if God is for you who can be against you but if 
God is against you, who can save you? Mm. Well, only God can save you. That's why we need to cry out to God for mercy. Yes. The thing I love about this psalm is in the early verses, Psalm 23 says, He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Just the emphasis on God, on how God is the one who makes us lie down. God is the one who leads us. Just the emphasis in this is on God. You know, he's the one that brings us. Like a shepherd brings his sheep from place to place. God is the one who leads us. Well, there you have it, folks. Episode number seven, Anvil and Hammer. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube. Follow on Twitter. Like on Facebook. Um, I'm, I'm getting better at the Instagram page, so... Hope you found this helpful. Please share it. Tell your friends about it. And comment. Please let us know your feedback, even if it's negative feedback. We just want some sort of feedback from our one listener. Bye, guys. We're out. Bye. Goodbye. Like, I suddenly love this toy so much. When yeah, I have he to be quiet. usually ignores that thing. Yeah, he does. But he gives him some tissue. He can play with that. He loves tissue. No, well, he eats the tissue. So. Yeah, but it's not going to harm him, is it? Yeah, well, you might eat too much. You shouldn't really eat tissue. It's like bleached paper.